Good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the 2021 presentation of um, our Giving Tuesday and Member Appreciation Program with Roger Scholey. We are excited to have him here today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Sheila Thomas, and I am the Development Manager at the San Diego History Center. And I first want to start off by just saying thank you um, to all of our members for being so loyal and supporting us, um, and to all those donors, and of course our uh, Board of Trustees who have been um, so dedicated to the San Diego History Center. Today is Giving Tuesday, and um, which is why we are giving you and presenting this program to you. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that you had all of the opportunities available to you um, if you wanted to donate to the San Diego History Center. We are, um, there is a match for all donations made by December 31st of this year. Um, and all donations for the annual giving campaign will be matched 100% up to $100,000. So that is um, huge and we do this and we're able to do this thanks to our um, board of trustees. So we definitely want to give a big, huge thank you out to them. I'll be posting in the chat um, some links if you are interested in donating tonight. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is Friday is our member appreciation party and we would love to see you all there. It is 9 to 11 a.m. at the History Center. We are doing this in conjunction with the um, MOPA and Model Railroad Museum. Both of those museums will also be open um, for your pleasure to enjoy along with um, some breakfast, continental breakfast items in each of the spaces. And I hear Santa is coming as well for pictures. So we hope to see you all there. I wanna be able to say thank you and meet you all in person. Um, that is Friday 9 to 11 a.m. at the History Center. Um, and one last little housekeeping is that we are going to be fielding all questions at the end of Roger's presentation. And you can ask questions by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, or you can also use the chat and please do feel free to use the chat to engage with others here um, in uh, that are a part of this presentation along with sharing stories. There may be, you may have been at some of these places that Roger will be sharing and talking about. So we'd love to hear your stories, share your stories with us. Um, and without further ado, I would love to introduce Bill Lawrence, our fearless CEO and president. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you everyone for being here. And uh, just to echo what Sheila has said, thank you very much for all of your support over the last year, over the last five years. We've got some lifetime members who are here as well in the room. And, and uh, thank you, um, as particularly on this Giving Tuesday. Um, the annual appeal is a time for nonprofit institutions uh, really around the world to um, hopefully make uh, a difference in the community. And that's what we're uh, hoping to do um, with the annual appeal that we're doing as well. It helps support the San Diego History Center, which is a vital civic asset. Um, it is, you're not here to hear me tonight, but we are here so much and so grateful to Roger Scholey, who um, is a very familiar name to um, all of us, but um, Roger is a journalist, a writer, an author, uh, a friend as well, not only to me personally, but to the San Diego History Center. Um, and he is an advocate for preservation of the region's history and for the region of San Diego. Um, many of you will know uh, Roger from his career with the San Diego Union Tribune. Uh, in the intro, uh, when we were talking uh, just before the meeting started, Roger was reminding me it was uh, 44 years with the San Diego Union Tribune, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, I truly believe that journalists are the scribes of our region's history and sit on the front line of history happening now. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Roger Scholey. Thanks very much, Bill, and welcome to everybody on this evening, uh, just before the holidays kick off in December. And I, I want to echo your appeal for everyone to support the History Center because it's my favorite institution in the park. It's uh, everything revolves around history, if, if you know what I mean. And 
uh, that's what we're here to talk about tonight is the last 40 years of San Diego history from 1980 to 2020. Um, before I start, let me just give you a bit of background how this came to be. When I was leaving the newspaper in, in retiring in, in 2018, Jeff Light, the editor, pulled me aside and said, I have something for you to do. And he told me that this organ company called Pediment uh, publishes with uh, newspapers around the country local histories of their communities and came up with a really interesting approach, which is to partner with the newspapers and usually a historical society in a city and tap the resources of the newspaper and use that as a marketing element to uh, pre-sell the books. So instead of having a lot of books left over with no one to buy them, they take uh, orders all throughout the year and then they're ready to publish them uh, about this time of the year or whenever they're proposed. So they've done hundreds of books, as I understand it, all over the country from large um, studies like this one, a broad sweep of San Diego history to individual events like a, a sports team's victory toward the Super Bowl or the Pope's visit to New York or that kind of a special event. <clears throat> well, anyway, the, uh, they wanted to do a San Diego Memories book, and at the beginning, I said, well, it's going to be hard to pack 150 years of pictures into 176 pages of a book, and you'd only get one picture per year at that rate, basically. So we came upon the idea of splitting this into different uh, periods. So the first one came out in 2018, which was up to 1930, and then... Uh, 1940, I mean, and then we did um, 1940 to 1960, which was the war years and the kind of the post post war period of San Diego. Uh, last year was 20 1960 to 1980, and then uh, the question came up: What do you do about the contemporary period? Uh, do people really want to learn uh, buy a history book about an era, an era that they're already very familiar with? or something. So we came up on the idea of a 40 year race to the end, so to speak. And um, I think we could have done a, two other books where I thought, well, four books is enough on your bookshelf, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is really an interesting period in San Diego history, if you think about it, those of you who've been here all your lives or recent uh, arrivals, because San Diego really grew up in this 40 year period in so many ways in all directions, good and bad. We had our share of scandals and disasters and crime and all kinds of bad things, but also some wonderful changes in the city and the region. And I think these pictures illustrate that pretty well. The, this book is divided by decades. So there's the, seven, the um, uh, 80s, 90s, 2000s and 2010s. And then we have a, several special chapters. And that's where I'm going to start with tonight. So let me share my screen and we'll get rolling. Thank you, Roger. And, and you're right. It's a really uh, special collaboration between the Union Tribune and the San Diego History Center. Yeah. And, and you have really been the, the catalyst for that, or at least doing all the heavy lifting. So thank you for that. Well, I also want to thank um, the History, uh, History Center staff in collecting the pictures uh, and helping edit them. And then this last book was pretty much a Union Tribune only photos because we hadn't given those pictures to the History Center yet. They have our collections during about 1981. And then the, the UT has kept the, the pictures since then because they're used very often. And um, I guess they wanted a control over for the time being. So that's maybe one day they'll you'll get all millions of pictures from digital pictures and everything uh, later, but that's, uh, that's how we put this book together. So um, the, the, uh, this is the, the title or the uh, cover of the book, as you can see, and I, we had all kinds of different ideas of what the best picture would be for the cover. And this one says so much about San Diego today, uh, looking to the future, the park in the foreground, my favorite place, uh, downtown, my second favorite place, and then out in the distance, Coronado, the San Diego Coronado Bridge, some iconic architecture <clears throat> to celebrate this one image. So I think it gives a sense of San Diego on the move, San Diego 
in the 21st century. And uh, this book is basically how do we get from the end of one century to the next. So let's see if we can move forward on the uh, pictures. Well, one of the chapters is called Uniquely San Diego. The first one I thought, instead of just leap, jumping right into a chronology, let's pick out some uh, fun pictures that, that say what, things that no other city can boast about, if you know what I mean. So these are pictures not in order in the book. They're sort of, they're a collection of exa examples of things you'll see. So uh, there are about 300 pictures or so in the book and I've forgotten how many I've pull up today, but it'll give you just a sense of what we have. So we see in this picture, Sandra, Sandra Rhodes, the famous designer, and she did art uh, design for the San Diego Opera and San Diego's chicken. You know, Ted Giannoulis, uh, who started this in 1975, playing the chicken on KGB radio, and it be became his lifelong career, basically, being this Clown in a chicken suit, of all things. It's the craziest thing. I don't know if any other city has such a thing, but he's done thousands of appearances. Hundreds of thousands of people have seen him, and he's still at it. Some more characters in the animal world. Uh, Ken Allen was a um, orangutan who um, escaped from the zoo three times in the 1980s. In the upper right-hand corner is Bayoon, the, the uh, panda cub born in the San Diego Zoo. Um, lower right is JJ, a whale that was being um, taken back to the sea, and then our other famous whale, Shamu, at the Sea World. So the city with the world famous zoo, you'd expect the animals to play a big part in our history. And they do. And then we have some characters, animate and otherwise, that we uh, have, including the to chicken, um, the one thing that's completely crazy is the kook, so-called Cardiff kook uh, statue that people um, play jokes on all the time, uh, dressing up in funny outfits, and it's always a kick. Uh, over the line tournament in uh, Mission, B, Mission Bay started in 1954, remains a San Diego iconic activity every summer. Uh, of course, the um, Hotel Del Coronado, but the playing polo on the uh, sands at the water at the uh, ocean front is a, something you don't see for too often. <clears throat> and then uh, skateboard, San Diego, in effect, was the homegrown uh, origin of skateboarding. Uh, so many people and uh, companies started that, and this great picture shows a skateboarder as if he's uh, skateboarding over the the bridge. Of course, you can't uh, overlook Comic-Con. They just had a special event here over the weekend. And here's a, a kid who's playing one of his favorite, favorite characters. And then Legoland, which opened in 1999, and another pop culture kind of thing that uh, San Diego is unique in the United States in having. Some more serious uh, uniquely San Diego images are the San Diego trolley that opened in 1981. We just opened the new Midcoast trolley up to UC San Diego. There hadn't been a, a streetcar system built in the United States uh, since World War II, and San Diego was the first one through a number of unique circumstances. Similarly, the Chicano Park below the uh, Coronado Bridge was the outgrowth of a um, demonstration in 1970 uh, by people living in Barrio Logan objecting to a, a San Diego or a California Highway Patrol uh, station there. And out of that came this amazing collection of murals. I think it's, uh, it's a national landmark. Yes, it is now. Yes. Um, San Diego, if you don't know this, hosted uh, some events at the 1984 Olympics at Fairbanks Ranch. And then we had uh, the start of the uh, America's Cup Racing and races several times in the 1980s and 90s. 1983, Queen Elizabeth came to San Diego on her trip to California. The joke about that was it rained every single day she was here, in spite of our so called fabulous weather. And the moment she left, the sun came out and was beautiful again. So that was unfortunate for our, our PR, but it was quite a uh, craziness in San Diego having the Queen of England coming and visiting San Diego. And she, there she is reading the governor, Duke Majin. 
Um, well, of course, Petco Park is another un uniquely San Diego thing of having a ballpark right by the waterfront, right in the middle of the urban center of San Diego, open in 2004. And uh, Central Library, the Horton Plaza, and the Waterfront Park are all very uh, special places in San Diego. Roger, I want to interrupt you just for a second because you have a personal connection to Petco Park, or at least a, fam a family connection, correct? Yes. Uh, let me see. I don't think. Oh, in the um, uh, in the distance of this picture, um, over in right field. Um, Today is the Shoulder Brothers Candy Factory building. It was moved out of the way to make room for the um, the ballpark, and you could see those um, brick buildings in the upper right hand corner there. And that one of them is the candy factory. I'm sorry, that's not right. It's, uh, the the white one in the middle. It hasn't been moved yet. This uh, uh, where that this central white building is a three story building is where it was an eighth and, and a K. And because they wanted to build the park of the park in that location, they had to move the building a block to the east. So that's where it was originally from 1924. So it's and, gonna celebrate its 100th anniversary in a couple of years. And that actually is one of the things that makes Petco Park unique too. And, and uh, that, that I understand from baseball fans that they, and Padre fans that they love, um, you know, the architecture of the park, but also the history of the park. That's yeah. Um, Horton Plaza was something I covered for a long time at the Union Tribune until it opened in 1985. And one of the reasons why I decided to leave, uh, retire in 2018 was because of that moment. They were saying, well, we're, Horton Plaza is passe. We're going to redevelop it and be, make it a, um, a creative office space complex. I said, I don't want to cover this all over again. So I said, I'll do that to somebody else. <laughs> and the other, another thing I covered for many years was the Central Library. Over the same period, the Horton Plaza was being developed. There was talk of trying to improve the Central Library downtown. I was uh, followed that for 20 years. And finally, it opened in 2013. And there was a lot of controversy about where it would be and would people still use it. And of course, it's a very popular thing today and a very unique. Um, um, space. And the other thing on the lower left is the waterfront park. Another controversy about going back to the 1920s and 30s is where should San Diego have its government headquarters? And um, at the time, there was a whole plan for a uh, mall of, of public buildings going to, toward Balboa Park, but that never came to pass. And instead, there were two parking lots on both sides of the county building. And in 2016, after at, at long last, the space was turned back to the public, and this wonderful um, uh, fountain system was built. And it's sort of like a beach, an urban beach for kids and families to come to these days. And it's amazing to see the waterfront park um, being used in many, uh, in many, many different ways with uh, festivals and events in, along the waterfront as well. Right. Um, some about other events of note, we had the Republican Convention in 1996, uh, lower, picture on the lower, on the right-hand side. In 1981, Dorothea Moorfield and her husband was celebrating the release of the Iranian hostages, including her husband, who was a diplomat in Tehran. Uh, of course, we had, we went to the Super Bowl in 1995. And the Obamas came here for a uh, called the Carrier Classic aboard the Carl Vincent in 2011. I want to make the point here that uh, the other books we had in the series were very uh, uh, photographic, but when you think about the technology of cameras and film and digital imaging over the same period, the quality of the photography and the ability of photographers to tell a story pictorially is just so much more dynamic than it used to be. So that's, that's another story about just ju journalism and re uh, history is how much we can do these days with uh, technology at our fingertips. Every everybody has a camera in their pocket these days. I mean, I hate to think of the history center will do when you have San Diegans who want have 
100,000, 500,000 pictures over a 50 year period. They said, here, you can have all my pictures. I mean, how <laughs> in the world will you do with 20 million images in the 20 years, you know? Well, I'm hoping that we'll be able to work with some of the great technology companies that are based here in San Diego <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah, sure to think. Uh, uh, something of history of, in my own uh, life was when the uh, Evening Tribune merged with the San Diego Union in 1992. Um, I started at the Tribune as a, as a summer uh, student in 1968 and worked, uh, covered or I mean, I wrote stories during my college at UC, UC San Diego as a core campus correspondent. So then I went to the union later on in 1974, but sad to see the Tribune uh, go away. And it was noted that the Tribune won the Pulitzer for its coverage of the PSA 182 crash. Yes. Um, I, um, we always want, we've tried to be as diverse as possible in getting images of, of uh, people, not just the uh, white men run, supposedly run countries, but everybody else who makes history, and and there's no uh, no uh, no less the case in San Diego. So, this we uh, we don't have a chapter on this, but I, we did as much as we could to gather as many pictures of as many diverse people of all walks of life in this book, and we did in the as we did in the other three books. So, representing that, we have Mother Teresa was in San Diego and the Dalai Lama. Both are kind of uh, iconic for men and famous men and women who made a difference in San Diego. So this is a page of showing some of the women um, we have uh, pictured in this book. And um, just to remind you who they are, Chris Kehoe was the first lesbian or gay person uh, openly elected to the San Diego City Council to become a major force in San Diego politics. Um, next to her is um, Gail Devers, who was a hurdle star. She was born in National City, and here she was preparing for the Atlanta uh, Olympics in 1996. Sally Ride, to the right of her, uh, was the first woman in space, and she came back and started the became the director of the California Space Center at UCSD. Below her, another astronaut, um, uh, Ellen Ochoa, who was born in La Mesa, um, to her left, or our left, is um, uh, Scout Bassett, who was in the Paralympics in 2016. She lost a, her left leg to a chemistry fire, but she came back to become a very uh, capable um, athlete. And finally, Wilma Wooten, famous these days because she's the head of the county health department, and you imagine what, what uh, she's been busy doing the last two years. On the male side, we have a collection of people that are worth talking about, upper, starting from the upper left, Kyle Mooney, uh, who was on, uh, an actor on Saturday, Saturday Night Live and went to Scripps Ranch High School. Uh, Sean White, um, our famous uh, flying tomatoes snowboarder from Carlsbad who competed in the 2016 um, uh, uh, Olympics in Italy. Um, there next to him is Charles McPherson, um, famous jazz uh, artist who came to San Diego in the 1970s. Greg Uglenis was another Olympian uh, who was born in, uh, East, in San Diego as a diving champion. Below him is Phil Mickelson, the golf star, Above that is uh, Joan Yuseau from the Chargers. Um, in between the two pictures on the bottom, we see um, Adam Lambert from uh, American Idol, uh, also a local, well, and uh, Walter Monk, a Mr. Ocean, Oceanography, who um, worked at Youth Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and finally, Tony Gwynn, Mr. Padre. So there's plenty of people we can celebrate in San Diego history, and these are just a sample of them pictured here. And I call these people the first couple of San Diego, Irwin and Joan Jacobs. I was looking up uh, their latest um, philanthropy. You know, they've given over $700 million just to San Diego institutions the last 20 years, including the uh, symphony and um, 
various hospitals. Uh, he is just a uh, boundless uh, philanthropy from the Jacobs. He's very such such a humble person. So we should be thankful that he's in our in our midst. Uh, another uh, family of note is the Rubios, who started the Rubios Taco Restaurant in 1983 uh, from a family recipe for fish tacos, and that's a that's a national craving. People love fish tacos. Roger, I think uh, Rubios number one is still in Pacific Beach, actually. Yeah, so they started there, 1983. Um, some companies are no longer with us, but while it was here, PSA was one of the popular airlines, of course, in San Diego, famous for its smile on the planes. Um, Legoland, uh, another representing the, the tourism business in our book, so to speak, opened in 1999. Uh, if, if you haven't been to Legoland, it's fun even for adults. It's kind of a fun way to, that they've depicted the world in so many interesting ways through Legos. And this is important. Uh, how many parts of the, you know, how many, there's no, no, no county in the country that has more Indian uh, reservations in San Diego at 18. And as you all know, the Indian uh, Native Americans have developed the uh, casino business independently because they have territorial uh, sovereignty, so to speak, on their reservations. And one of the first ones was Saquon um, in uh, Dehesa. Um, it started as a, as a bingo parlor in 1983. And to give you a sense of what happened, what they grew up to, then just in 2019, they had a $219 million expansion on that very site. Unbelievable. Uh, their success story, of course, is Qualcomm, is founded by Erwin Jacobs and others. How many of you know that, that Qualcomm stands for Quality Communications? This brings up a good point about this picture, picture book. The many of the important things that happened in San Diego in the any time period uh, are not partic particularly pictorial. So I said to our uh, photo editor, we need to find some pictures of Qualcomm. And you know, a, 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 um, a silicon chip is not the most photographic thing you could get in love with. But this picture of workers at Qualcomm putting some of those Qualcomm phones together represents what amazing company this turned out to be. You remember, uh, Bill, that in the 90s or so, when his Qualcomm was getting uh, so successful, people would have um, shares in the company uh, to, as an inducement to work there. And they'd be called the quillionaires but they, because they would come out of the um, <laughs> <laughs> they would retire at the age of 30 and they'd have, I don't know, $5 million in money from their uh, shares, which is amazing. So, yeah, it's, it, it's, it sounds like a similar, a little bit of a similar story for those that were uh, instrumental in, in helping um, price company or price, a price company as well. Um, one thing that's uh, that Roger, just a, a little, uh, San Diego History Center plug, we were honored to receive from Andrew Viterbi, who is one of the co-founders of Qualcomm with Erwin Jacobs, um, uh, the Viterbi chip. So that very first chip um, that is now part of the San Diego History Center collection. Hmm. So like a moon rock. Like a moon rock. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, another San Diego invention is uh, craft brewery. I mean, there's craft breweries all over the country, but San Diego has about 130 these days. And here are the founders of the uh, Stone Brewery at their facility uh, in North County. Greg has a much longer beard today. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and then I have a set, I pull up pictures of, I call this history preserved and destroyed. And um, I'm still so sore that the San Diego Stadium was demolished instead of being repurposed for San Diego State Aztecs. But who cares about the South Bay power plant? It went down and it's a it's gonna be the that site in Chula Vista Bay Fund's gonna be one of the major new things to watch for in the next few years as it redevelops into an, a another uh, convention facility. Yeah and it's also amazing Roger to see just the, the speed that's uh, taking place on the stadium site or SDSU West. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, one thing that did not get saved downtown was the Tower Bowl. I remember going there for birthday parties, I guess, playing bowling when I was little. Uh, it gave way to the One America Plaza 
tower that's there now on Broadway, at foot of Broadway. And then uh, uh, the San Salvador Cabrillo's ship was recreated uh, and, and set sail in 2015 so, as a part of the San Diego Maritime Museum. Yeah, that was an amazing project for all, them. All by, mostly all by volunteers over several years. Yes. And of course, they didn't, they didn't have any plans to work from. They didn't have any, any uh, documentation of, the, of, the, of Cabrillo's boats. So they had to scour uh, uh, archives all over the uh, Spain, I guess, to try and find something that they could work from. Another thing that was saved in the in this period was this, was the Fox Theater. So many movie theater palaces have gone uh, been raised for um, other purposes, including San Diego. But through an amazing idea, the theater was uh, encapsulated in the Symphony Towers project, and the San Diego Symphony got uh, took ownership of the Fox Theater itself, uh, now called Copley Symphony Hall. And this is the opening night, 1985. Well, another thing that runs through any city's uh, history is uh, what I'm calling disasters, scandals, and horrors. And San Diego certainly had its share of those things. Um, there was a massacre at the McDonald's restaurant at the San Ysidro in 1984, where 21 died and 19 were injured. We had political scandals like uh, Congressman Cunningham, uh, I think he's the all time uh, record holder of bribery in Congress. And um, then we had Duncan Hunter, who was uh, forced to resign <coughs> over campaign violations. And probably the king of all scandals was David Dominelli, who built an $80 million uh, Ponzi scheme in the 1980s and brought down the mayor, Roger Hitchcock, in the, in the uh, scandal because of campaign violations as well. And I, there's more of them. I didn't, I didn't want to make this such a downer of a presentation, but we had several other ones that are pretty horrible. But one of them is Betty Broderick. She killed her husband in a fit of pique because he left her and married somebody else and she killed him and, and his new wife. We had the, the thing called Heaven's Gate in 1997, where, um, was it here, um, looking at my notes. There were 39 bodies found at a Rancho Santa Fe mansion in 1997, uh, because they believed that they, that they would all uh, be picked up by a space, by a, a comet flying past Sandy by the, by the earth that year. And they felt that they committed suicide, their souls would all fly up to heaven. Well. We don't know if that happened, but that was an incredible, crazy thing. And we've had a number of murders. And the one of the saddest of all is Chelsea King, who was uh, killed uh, while she was on a run in 2010. And there was a memorial. And that's a picture of the memorial service to her. And out of that came Chelsea's law to raise the um, penalties against uh, sex offenders. <clears throat> one of the most crazy things that happened in San Diego was a um, guy named Sean Nelson had personal problems. He was an army vet, but he, for some reason, he went out and stole a National Guard tank from the National Guard and um, the convoy area. And he got stuck on a, a divider in the freeway and he wouldn't come out and the police were forced to shoot him because he just wouldn't surrender. Roger, what was um, really too interesting, I was at KFAB at this time, and um, the, it, was, it was almost like um, the O.J. Simpson chase in some ways. You know, the, the helicopters going, um, following behind, or following the uh, tank, and it was driving, going all over mm -hmm. Mesa, and, and uh, uh, photographer friend Joe Wiedemann did amazing photography of that, uh, video, videography, I should say. Yeah. Uh, then we had uh, two giant fires in the, just within four years apart, the Cedar Fire in 2003, uh, that hit my community of uh, Scripps Ranch where about 2,600 homes were torched. And just four years later, the Witch Creek Fire and other ones forced 300,000 people to leave and, um, uh, shelter in place as well and I, my family and we all went to my father's house in La Jolla um, for a couple of days while that blew over and we keep having these fires all over 
California. This that was horrible then, but this past year has been horrendous. And then last year, uh, you all remember the Bonham Richard fire at the waterfront where an amphibious uh, ship uh, was, I think the, they decided it was on our son part of some sailor and uh, it was a total loss. It would have cost $3.2 billion to repair this vessel. And uh, I don't know if many of you remember in 2011, we had this uh, blackout. They had 7 million people in Southern California uh, because of some switching problem in the um, Arizona. And I remember that day because um, in our, our neighborhood with nobody having any electricity, one of my son's friends was working at, De at a Denny's and he brought a whole couple bags of ice and we sat out in front of our houses and had cocktails and tried to get over it. So sometimes you can make light of these disasters. Mm -hmm. It's not a pleasant thing, but it, it, you have to get through it. And of course, the worst of all about this 40 year period of car is, would be the 9-11 attacks in New York that hit San Diego as well as everywhere else. And this picture is, I th find interesting because it shows you the, uh, the, San the Union Tribune uh, editor uh, editors all gathering together, <coughs> deciding uh, what to do in covering this event that day. And we still live with the re repercussions of that that uh, attack and 9-11. Uh, uh, there's a chapter at the end called 2020 because last year was such a momentous year in so many ways. Uh, uh, this is not a 20, 2020 picture, but it does represent the, the Black Lives Matter movement that broke out in San Diego along with the rest of the country. Same thing with Donald Trump. Uh, here he is visiting the border wall prototype in 2018, but you remember that was such a major issue in the 2016 and the 2020 elections and how to deal with the border. <clears throat> uh, we have immigration issues. This was a picture of uh, one of the migrants in one of those caravans coming up from Central Cal uh, Mexico, Central America. And then of course, so we're still living with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, how do you, do you all remember the freeways were empty, the beaches were empty. Um, there, you couldn't buy toilet paper. So this guy was bought, brought toilet paper and sharing it with motorists on a road in San Diego. Uh, all of our entertainment venues closed down like the House of Blues downtown, <coughs> excuse me. And then the convention center was turned into a shelter for uh, the homeless who had nowhere else to go. Um, here we are at uh, Strip, 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 Strip Memorial Hospital, nurses all uh, uh, waving and, and appreciating the, the uh, love we all had for the medical workers. So I have sort of finale to the, uh, our little presentation tonight. I have picked out some pictures of just they're kind of fun pictures. Uh, this is a group of a little girl's Thumbelinas at the North Park Dance Studio in 2002. Here's a, a celebrity cruise ship in 2006. San Diego went big for the cruises, the cruise industry in this period. And uh, of course it apparently died last year. <clears throat> now it's limited back to life in San Diego. So we're seeing a few more coming to San Diego these days. Uh, and every so often, a couple times a year, we get this sort of a picture that the dog was all run out to get San Diego with the snow-capped mountains in the distance. And it is San Diego, is, it's just amazing in so many natural ways, in the sense that you can surf in the morning, go skiing and snowboarding in the afternoon, uh, which most places in the country can't, can't boast that. And finally, I end up with a picture of our favorite place, Balboa Park. This is uh, represents the 100th anniversary of the Panama California Exposition of the park, uh, of the California Tower. This is a picture taken from a drone, so another element of um, technology that photographers are able to take advantage of. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, the only uh, unfortunate part about that celebration was we had this great big giant party planned all year, but the 
people who organized it just couldn't raise any money to make it happen. So it was, uh, well, uh, Todd Gloria was the councilman and promised we have to do more than a, we have to promise more than just a, a Costco sheet cake, but that's basically all we got out of that event. But still, the History Center and others found ways to celebrate it anyway with special events, special exhibitions. And I'm hoping that we'll do better in 2035 when we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the second exposition. So, Bill, that's our, our uh, presentation for the evening, and uh, we all enjoyed it. Roger, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to see these uh, pictures. Just a reminder, um, we're happy to take questions if anyone has. I saw that uh, San Diego History Center trustee Chuck Kaminsky, when we were talking about the Carlsbad or the, the demolition and the, the smokestacks up there. But Roger, I wanted you to take just a moment because um, and talk a little bit about the photo staff um, that, that, that you worked with. Um, you know, over your 44 year career and um, your some of your thoughts about those professionals because they are they really are journalists unto themselves. Yeah, I would say that that whole profession has developed so interestingly in the last uh, half century from uh, photographers who rush around taking quick pictures and rushing back to the office to develop the pictures. To, to today's photographers who have so much more at their fingertips to do their jobs. Uh, photographers have a, a really unique role in, in the news business. Um, we, for reporters, the word people would uh, recommend, suggest things they could do, but they are, they're the ones with a keen eye for, for an image. So that you would send them out to an, on an assignment and always uh, invariably find some angle that no one else has caught. So it's, um, uh, nowadays, reporters are expected to take their cell phones and take pictures themselves, and you see that in the credit line sometimes when a photographer isn't available. And the uh, UT has gone from about 25 photographers down to four full-time photographers, four or five, and the rest of them are taken by um, freelance photographers. So the profession, not just photographers, but all journalists have taken a big hit in the last few years as the nature of newspapers has changed. So it's yeah. a sad thing because um, the pictures, I don't know if we'd be able to do this book in 20 years because we wouldn't have the staff photography to draw from. Well, I think that there, hopefully we will, um, you know, be able to turn to um, the public for some of those photos. We're going to, you know, um, crowdsourced uh, history, I think is very important uh, now and is something on the, on the horizon. Um, it will be interesting to see it. And Roger, you've definitely seen a, a change in the industry in the last uh, 40 some odd years. Probably, how many people were probably with the, the Tribune when you first opened, uh, when you first started? Um, maybe not when you were an intern, but let's say in the- I'd say around 1990 uh, yeah. was probably the peak of about 500 people in the two newsrooms. And now there's less than a hundred. Yeah. And that's and, all across the country, let alone the newspapers that have gone out of business. So it's a very sad thing because without people on the ground covering local news, as you can see, for, uh, politicians and others get into trouble because they're not. There's nobody watch talking over them, and that's that's an important role in our society. We do have a question from uh, one of our 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 participants and asking: Does the book include Mission Bay? The largest man-made aquatic park. Uh, let's see. I don't remember if we have a. We did a lot of that in the, the earlier book. Yeah, in the fifties, I think is when. Uh, when right. That so uh, perhaps not this current edition, but um, this is a good opportunity for a plug for for one, two, and three. Yeah. <laughs> as well, if you can find <laughs> one, we have yeah. a few versions of those. You can always you can actually order them directly from Pediment. Uh, publishing, but I forget whether we have a any significant picture of uh, Mission Bay. Uh, we did quite a lot of good ones the last time. Well, Roger, and, uh, and bef uh, I'm going to tell a little behind the scenes story here. In that, before we got started, and we were doing not our rehearsal, but <clears throat> we had opened the the, the Zoom room, that uh, you were saying that you may want to do Mission Bay as is a, a project. 
Yeah, well, I should talk about the future because I don't want to. I'm not done yet. I'd like to do this every year. <laughs> I think I gave the. I gave we're, we're not. Dozen, you're, we're not going to let you be done. So I, I, think I gave you like a dozen ideas for for books after this is done. But uh, next year I wanted to do a book I'm calling the Bays of San Diego. So one half of the book would be San Diego Bay, and you turn it over, and the other half would be Mission Bay. And then Mike stepped to the city planner suggested that I link the two by talking about the idea of a canal linking the two bays, which is a ridiculous idea, but they come up with it every so often. I think I remember that being talked about when yeah. Susan Golding was. Susan Golding, the mayor, was touting that. And you can't exactly order water to go from one thing to the other. It doesn't really work that way. but. It might although, be a, although historically that is correct, because if you recall, the San Diego River uh, used to flow into San Diego Bay. Right. So there was never a there was never a formal channel in historic <laughs> times. Anyway, there wasn't any link between the two. Yeah, there was no Mission Bay. Until. But at one time, you know, Point Loma was an island, and then the water would was around it. So, but I don't yeah. think anybody lived there here at the time. This millions of years ago. True, and and Mission Bay was False Bay. If you look at exactly. on those historic maps. <clears throat> so anyway, that book I think would be lots of fun to do because it would draw on uh, the History Center's really wonderful collection of images of both both bays. So I'm looking forward to thinking about that. And then in 2023, um, San Diego will be getting ready to be the world design capital that we just uh, got a, a, a notice of, of a few weeks ago. And so I'd like to do something about the um, design of San Diego in uh, it's all its um, interesting ways, both small development and great big icons. Uh, Roger, that brings up a good, good point too, because much of the San Diego coverage or the book is, we call it San Diego memories, but part of that is also Tijuana. And I do know in um, the some of the earlier editions, we, we do have some photos from Tijuana, but as we in 20, I think it's 2024 that the, the, the world design um, capital moniker is is bestowed upon the region that, um, you know, that talking about the border is 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 critically important, not only from a business standpoint, but from a cultural standpoint as well. Right, right exactly. So we'll have to figure out how to cover and, and um, represent T1 in the same way. Yeah, well, and if I could, I'm gonna do a quick plug for uh, the digitization efforts that we have been doing at the San Diego History Center. Many of the folks um, on the program today know about the, um, our new method of being able to search for photographs in our collections. And you can get to it by going to collections.sandiegohistory.org. And you can also get it to it from our, um, our website, our home site of sandiegohistory.org. But um, it's a great resource uh, for finding, uh, locating, um, and actually uh, licensing and immediately downloading imagery out of the photo collection. We have roughly uh, 2.5 million images is what we like to say in our collections. And about 80,000 of those to date are digitized. Many of the ones that you uh, that are up here from our collection as part of uh, volumes one, two, and three of San Diego Memories are 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 already in a digital format and available. So, and they're they they make great holiday gifts as well. So yeah, not too not too late to order with. No, and you, and you have copies at the at the History Center, I think, as well, right? We do have copies of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the book at the History Center. Uh, yes, you can walk in, and uh, on, when we're open on uh, uh, Friday and Saturday and Sunday, I believe. Um, we're also in the process of, uh, and we won't have it uh, ready in time, but creating a new online store uh, experience that you'll be able to get your San Diego history fix. Um, quickly and easily and efficiently. If and I guess I should. Oh, I was just going to mention, if anyone is still interested, we have um, copies of all of the books, San Diego Memories 1, 2, 3, and 4 at the History Center. Um, and I just put the link in the chat if you're interested in purchasing any of those. They make great uh, gifts and coffee table books as well. Right. Yes, and a suggestion again from uh, that, uh, if we're talking about the border, don't forget the sewage issue. So, 
which I know the Union Tribune has covered uh, ad nauseum. Yeah, decades. Yeah, <laughs> and it's still with us. Okay, um, I think at this point, uh, Roger, uh, unless there are any additional questions, um, it that... looks like there's a question in the Q and A. I haven't ah. on it yet. Oh, thank you, Sheila. Oh, um, do you highlight the expanding Muslim community? Um, let's see. Yes, I think there's a picture of uh, Muslims in the book. I don't remember, but it's we tried to be as comprehensive as possible and wide ranging. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Roger, thank you so mm -hmm. very, very much. We, as always, appreciate your insight, your experience, your passion for San Diego and the San Diego History Center and um, continue to make our, our region a better place. So thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Bill, for having me tonight. Sheila. Thank you very much. And uh, we are hoping to see everybody on Friday morning or if you can make it by, stop by for some coffee and breakfast, we'd love to see you and say thank you face to face. Thank you, everybody. That will conclude today's presentation. Uh, Roger, again, our sincere thanks. Our, th our sincere thanks as well to all of you. Um, and if you're watching this via recording, thank you as well for your interest in San Diego history and the support that you provide to the San Diego History Center. Have a nice evening.